words from Isaiah in Psalm 18 on this, this day in history where the closest thing to the coronation of, of King Jesus happened on Palm Sunday. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. To the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Well, we do remember uh, that occasion when people took their cloaks off and laid down some of their clothes and, uh, so that you could ride over them. It was a time of recognizing your honor, your majesty, for you are truly great. And Lord, in your church this morning, at this small place, we do the same. We say you are the king of glory and we are thrilled that we are yours, and we will be subjects, glad subjects, to follow you as you reign in our hearts every day. So accept our praise now, our worship, our adoration, and we come to you in the name of our blessed Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Amen. You may be seated. As is our uh, tradition, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord, let us silently confess our sins to the Lord, knowing that his grace is abundant. Father, we say amen now together as the body of Christ. Our dear Father, you know we are not who we should be. We have broken your law in many ways. We have pursued our own kingdoms instead of yours. We come to you with repentant and contrite hearts. Forgive us in your mercy and grant your promised grace to us and our King and Savior. Amen. Well, please stand and hear the good words from the Apostle Paul. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulation that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Amen. Brothers and sisters, what is it that we affirm and believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and we will read God's word together responsibly from um, Matthew 21, 5 through 10. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, humble, and mounted on a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, him on, and put on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed after him were shouting. Hosanna in the highest. Amen.
Well, let us pray together. Well, we pray that we would know the hope that lies before us, every one of us, not just as a wish to uh, put us in a better mood, but as a certainty that you will come again and that we will be with you for all eternity in glory, without sin, in pure enjoyment of one another and of our Lord Christ. Well, we pray that you would root us and ground us in your love that you have for us, this love that is immeasurable, is broad and high and deep and long, that we may comprehend it with all of the saints, that we may truly know deep within our beings that we are loved by the almighty God of the universe, the God of the galaxies, the God of our King Jesus, the God who moved the stone away and made him come from the dead for our sins. Help us not to doubt your love. And Lord, because of that, fill us with your spirit so that we may do more things that we could even ask. Father, we pray that you would uh, draw near to those uh, who draw near to you. We claim that promise. We pray for those that are suffering, that are uh, approaching surgery, that you will um, calm their hearts, that they would know that they are within the palm of your hand, that you recognize and know every tear and every flutter of their heart because um, they mean so much to you, that they are precious to you. Thank you for answering many of our prayers for those who have been sick and suffering. While we pray for our children uh, and for our parents, our young parents, that um, they, would, uh, they would have homes where the word of the Lord is uh, read and believed, that they would pray together. We pray that for all of us. Um, for where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst. So we recognize you as our king today. We do say, Hosanna, save us, Lord, and may your coming kingdom come soon, Lord Jesus. And we pray as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, please stand as I read to you the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. And... Uh, I've, I've selected this passage, um, even though we're going through First Peter, I've selected this passage uh, because it's, in my mind, um, the essence of uh, why we can say Hosanna to the coming king. He, meaning Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on 
earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So in the spring of 1989, I guess before some of you were born, in the spring of 1989, the campus of Baylor University was electrified with energy. There was definitely something in the air. The students were volunteering for everything because they all just wanted to be part of something great. And Oh my goodness, this was it. Those students unashamedly threw their efforts into blowing up balloons, red, white, and blue, and tying them until we had blisters on our fingers. They were uh, painting banners, they were passing out flyers, they were setting up chairs, you name it. And night after night, and in between their classes, they came together to work hard for, really, the event of a lifetime. Their motivation was impressive, and nothing like this that I know of had ever happened on that campus. So I remember the day he came. I remember being proud to be there. I remember being very proud to be an American. I remember the cars, the policemen, the lights, the entourage. I remember him waving at us through the bulletproof glass of the black Cadillac. President Reagan had decided to visit the Baylor campus. And let me tell you, I don't know if I have ever seen such adoration. That's what it was. It was adoration. Mary Margaret Knight, along with uh, many others at, at the convoca convocation at the president's speech, had seats that were, that were close. Now, it's one thing to see the president on TV. It's quite another thing to see him in person. And, of course, being Ronald Reagan, his speech was absolutely flawless. He inspired us and encouraged us and challenged us to love our country and to serve it well. And I suddenly found that I loved the man. I felt my heart fill with awe and respect. And the patriotic music began after his speech, and we shouted and clapped and roared and watched as really hundreds, I should say probably thousands of red, white, and blue balloons were uh, floated down in celebration of our country and of this great man. As I recall that moment, I have often asked myself, especially when I read this passage I just read to you, David, do you at least have that amount of respect and awe and adoration towards the Lord Jesus Christ? If we felt the way we feel about great men of the earth toward the Lord Jesus, don't you think it would revolutionize our lives? Uh, our church, especially our gathered worship. We wouldn't, uh, I mean, wouldn't we throw our, our efforts into serving him with gladness and joy? When we get over our petty concerns and realize that there is something great going on and we, of all people, get to be part of it, the church. This passage, one word, kept coming to me all week long, and that is this word, majesty. Majesty. It comes from the Latin. It means greatness. So when we ascribe majesty to someone, we are acknowledging greatness in that person and voicing our respect for him or her. Majesty is a word which the Bible uses to express the thought of the greatness of God, our maker, our Lord. 
Listen to a few of the scriptures as it speaks of his majesty. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. Thy throne is established of old. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. You know, Peter, after he had seen Christ royal glory just a glimpse at the transfiguration said we were eyewitnesses of his majesty after his ascension the bible says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens majesty when applied to god is always a declaration of his greatness and an invitation to worship. My favorite theologian, J.I. Packer, said, this knowledge of the majesty of God is knowledge which Christians uh, today largely lack. And that is one reason why our faith is so feeble and our worship so flabby. We are modern men. And modern men, though they cherish great thoughts of man, have as a rule small thoughts about God. When the man in the church, let alone the man in the street, uses the word Jesus, the thought in his mind is rarely of divine majesty. He goes on. We are poles apart from our evangelical forefathers at this point even when we confess our faith in their words when you start reading Luther or Edwards or Whitfield though your doctrine may be theirs you soon find yourself wondering whether you have any acquaintance at all with the mighty God whom they knew so intimately boy that's true isn't it so what has happened to us uh, the church at large when worship is evaluated more by how we feel rather than whether it's, it's, it's true adoration about the character and the word and of God something is deeply wrong and don't misunderstand it. I, I really feel where feelings for God are dead worship is dead you should have feelings for God you should have tears in your eyes you should have tears of, 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 of joy but affection for the Savior starts with the majesty of the triune God. You think about that. When, when Isaiah saw the Lord, Jesus, high and lifted up, what did he say? Do you remember? When Peter saw the full nets and gazed back at the one who had knowledge of every fish in the sea, what did he say? You compare this with the easy, breezy spirituality of our time, and you see quite a contrast. To so many today, Jesus is a dude, a buddy, a pal, and we treat him not with reverence and awe, but with flippant familiarity, the kind that breeds contempt. So, oh, it is true Jesus is a friend of sinners. We like that. Absolutely, he is a friend of sinners, namely because of his saving work on the cross where he bled out for us. But he is the Lord of glory, the creator, the holy, majestic God. And what we need is a dose of the majesty of gentle, humble Jesus. And that is what is before us in Colossians. And that is what... Palm Sunday is all about. That is why we read in our responsive reading that people recognized for a bit the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason Paul writes this passage is that he wants people to know that, that Christ must be dealt with. Every human being must say, who are you? What are you? What have you done? 
He is not just some political revolutionary, a messianic schemer, a Galilean charismatic holy man, or a counter-cultural crusader for God. He is divine majesty in flesh. He knows that if you have the right God, meaning Paul, he knows that if you have the right God, you will have the right kind of life. You will have hope. You will know love. If you don't have the right God, Jesus, you will be sorely disappointed for a long, 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 long time because you did not bow before his majesty and thought he was just whatever some type of Sunday school thing, you know? Every human being asks questions about our existence. We want to know where we came from, where we are going, what is this life all about? The world says we're born, we live, we die. That's it. That's all. That's all. And God says everything you need to know about who you are, what you are to do, and what will happen is all contained in the person and the words of Jesus Christ, the majestic creator of the universe. To know him is to know God. To know him is to have hope. To know him is to know love. And Paul paints a portrait of Jesus that will inspire your mind, it will motivate your heart, it will fuel your worship, and it will ignite your service if you see majesty there. The letters on the frame of the portrait say majesty all around that portrait. Let's see what he means. He is majestic. Why is Jesus Christ majestic? Because he is the image, the image of the invisible God. That's how he puts it. Him, Jesus, from Galilee, from Nazareth, is the image of the invisible God. So image has to do with representation. A photograph is a representation of you. So the concept here is that Christ is an exact representation of God. As verse 19 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. All, not just some. All, Hebrews 1, 3 says, And he, Christ, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Jesus said in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. You want to know what God is like? Listen to me. Watch me. John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. So who is this Jesus? Right? Who is he? And make no mistake, Jesus and the Bible claim that, that he is God in the flesh. He is the supreme Lord of the universe as demonstrated by his unique relationship with the Creator. He is not just majestic because of his unique relationship with the Creator, but also because of his unique relationship over creation. Notice how large little Jesus gets in this passage. Why is he majestic? Why does Paul write this? He is the firstborn over all creation. Has that verse bothered you before? The firstborn over all creation. Are you saying Jesus was born? No, not at all. This cannot and does not mean Christ was a created being. No, no. Verse 17 tells us that he was before all things. Verse 19 tells us that he possesses all the fullness of deity, including eternality. It does not mean that he was created. It means that he is first in rank, first in honor. Paul is saying that the highest 
of honor belongs to the son. And the father would say the same thing. And the son would say the same thing about the father. So he's the firstborn over creation. Ah, next he is the, also the agent of creation. He created all things, as John uh, chapter 1, verse 3 says. All things came into being by Christ. And apart from him, nothing came into being. I, I've probably told, uh, I've told many of you this story, but I love it. I love to tell it because it, is, it, is, it was really the first time I remember tasting true worship or majesty. I was a sophomore in high school. I was spending a, a summer in the Texas Hill Country at a fabulous Christian camp. The name of that camp was Penile. Y'all remember the story of Jacob? When Jacob wrestled with the, when the God-man, the God-man went to him and wrestled him, and he said, I have seen God face to face. Penile. That happened to many of us the, on those summers, every high school summer. There were about 90 kids gathered around a, a campfire, and we, after we had sang and heard some testimonies, a lot of testimonies about the Lord's work in each other's lives that week and throughout the year, and then we read some scriptures. Our leader, a man named David Whitelock, said, okay, let me pray for you. Now you can all go back to your cabins with your counselors. And I asked him, I said, can I, can I stay a little longer? And he said, okay. Um, he had a flashlight, and one of those, those red ones, you know, where you can shoot it up into the heavens, and it's a pointer. And I asked him, I said, can you show me some constellations? They, 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 would, they would just pop out of him when he was reading the scriptures. And he did. He said, okay, you see that one right there that looks like a teacup? And I was like, yeah, okay. So I had my first glimpse of Scorpio, of Orion, of Pleiades, of Draco the dragon, of Antares, that little tiny planet there in the middle of Scorpio who's, who's, uh, who's, existence is 500 times bigger than our sun. I saw the Northern Cross for the first time. Uh, and I was speechless. All I knew was there's a Big Dipper and it kind of points towards that one that doesn't move. Oh yeah, the North Star. On the tail end of the Little Dipper. That's all I knew. But the heavens were opened to me. So he showed me these things. Just me and him. He also read this. You know these words. He read them to me. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings the starry host out one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Little taste of majesty. The majesty of Jesus Christ. And I sat down and was quiet and worshiped and bawled like a baby. I felt my smallness and wondered why this majestic Lord of glory would have anything to do with a little curly headed kid from Houston, Texas that was definitely a sinner. So not only is he the firstborn worthy of all honor, all our honor, not only is he your creator, he is also your sustainer. See what it says here. He keeps all things together. He keeps every heart beating, every mind thinking, every eye blinking, every insect moving, every atom whirling. And does not that stretch our puny little minds? Who is this man? Oh, disciples, who do you say that I am? I know what other people say about me, but who do you say that I am? 
So we ascribe majesty to Christ because he is the image of the invisible God. We ascribe majesty to Christ because he is the firstborn of all creation, worthy of highest honor. We ascribe majesty to Christ because he created all things and holds them all together. And last, we ascribe majesty to Christ because he has made peace with God for us by the blood of the cross to reconcile us to himself. I told you earlier that it was a profound moment for me when I, I saw President Reagan wave at me from the, uh, from the back of that black Cadillac. It made me feel that I was part of something great. It truly, truly did. It motivated me to work hard for such a great man and friends Christ has not just waved at me from the car. He has left the comfort of his palace and taken human flesh upon himself to redeem me and his church and to purchase us from the clutches of the devil and of our stupid belief in our own sin. He has made me a friend of God when I was his enemy. He has granted me forgiveness from the guilt of my oppressive wrongdoing. He has given me a hope of resurrection, as it says here, the firstborn, the firstborn from among the dead, which means you're going to be the second or the third or the fifth or the millionth. He has taken my shame, my blame, my pain, and buried it all at the cross. My past does not define me anymore. Jesus Christ's past does. And I'm saying all these things about me, but you know you're saying them about yourself and about your Savior. So on this day, a little over 2,000 years ago, some people made a parade and gathered some palm branches like our little ones have and laid their clothing down for Jesus to ride over. And they were singing at the top of their lungs, Hosanna. They were quoting the scripture, Hosanna. You know what that word means? It means save us. Save us now. Save us from the Romans. And Jesus is saying, I've come to save you a lot more from a political ideology. They were singing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And it is coming and it is here, but not in totality. Hosanna in the highest, they said. At that point in time, they saw what many never see. They saw the majesty of Christ. They saw it, and it just burst forth from their heart. But I promise you this, they did not see what you have seen this morning. You said, oh, it would have been so nice to be there. Uh, no, they, they don't have what Paul wrote. They didn't have it then. To you has been revealed the glory of God. God has told you this morning that Christ is the exact image of God, that he is your creator and sustainer, and hopefully, as the passage ends, your redeemer. He is supreme, and his supremacy demands our glad, our glad, glad, glad submission. As a supreme Lord of the universe, is there an area in your life or my life that we are withholding from him? You can't go here. No, no, he, he's the great one. He's the majestic one. You're just a little tiny creation on a little tiny, tiny, tiny planet called Earth. Say to him this morning, Lord Christ, here is my career. Here is my family. Here is my anger. Here is my schedule. Here, here is my bank account. Here is my pain. Here is my disappointment. Here are my addictions. Here is my marriage. Here is my body. I love you, my King, Lord Jesus, because you are great. I'll serve you. I'll study for you. I'll attend here. And I'll learn to love. And I'll learn to live for you. And we should say, I hope, Lord Jesus, that my life becomes nothing but a cascade, a cascade of red and white <laughs> balloons, red, white, and blue balloons to celebrate your majestic person. 
And we say, open our eyes that we may see and thus adore you from now on until you take me home. Blessed, Hosanna. Blessed is he who has come in the name of the Lord. may be seated. Yeah, the, so the, the, uh, the angels can't look at Christ without bending their head down in, because of his greatness. That mystery is so bright. What is the mystery? That's the scriptures often talk about. The mystery has come. What is the mystery? It's this. It's this, that the majestic God of creation became in flesh and took upon him the form of a human being. So that you would know this is what God is like. This is why he came to shed his blood and his body so that you may be with him. That's why we celebrate this every Sunday. That 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 is majesty. That is majesty. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body that is given for you, so all of you eat of it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me, the great one, the good one, the one who will, will love you no matter how many mistakes you make. So eat, drink. And enjoy your Savior.
the love of the Savior expressed to you, the majesty of God before you, eat and drink. receive the benediction. May you know the enabling grace of God in your struggles. May you experience the love and mercy of the cross of the Lord Jesus each moment. Trust your King and have hope in his daily provision. Amen. Amen.